Welcome back to Data Driven Recruiting. My name is Sophia Beck, and I'm joined by my co host Tigran Sloyan today. Hi, Tigran. Hey, Sophia. So, second episode uh, doing completely remote. This is fun. I can get used to this. Yeah, yeah. And today, I think so we're we going to talk about, about something. Yeah, talking about something very, uh, very popular topic among a lot of technology organizations, which is remote hiring, not just remote interviewing, but actually hiring people remote. Um, and also how one should think about compensation. Right. So uh, remote work has been gaining popularity for a long time, like actually hiring remote employees that are not in any way close to you. Uh, they could be in another state, they could be even in another country. And these days with essentially everybody working remote, that's gaining a lot of ground. A lot of a lot more people are talking about it. A lot of more people are considering it because all of a sudden right. you start realizing that, you know, this is not that hard. Yeah? I think when you've never really done it, it feels like, oh my God, how could we ever work when we're not co-located? But I think it's starting to change uh, right. many leaders' perspective on how you do this. Yeah, and people who have been doing remote in a smaller scale are now rolling it out, you know, much wider uh, scale. And I guess, yeah, Slack and Twitter and a lot of companies have been also saying that their new engineering hub is remote. That's the location that they yeah. are going to grow. Right. What are some of the, I guess, the advantages of like what's not only just the us need to work remotely at the moment, but like what are some of the key benefits of hiring people remote? Yeah, I mean, the number one benefit really is having uh, much wider access to incredible talent. Right. Because if you're hiring in a uh, co-located approach and you're in one of the tech hubs, I mean, you're facing insane competition for a sliver of talent that's available throughout the world. When you open it up to the rest of the world, all of a sudden uh, you have so much, so many more options, right? It goes from mm -hmm. like 0.1% to a huge, huge portion. Uh, and these days as education has become more and more democratized, uh, talent that's available throughout the world is huge. Like maybe you could argue like 30 years ago when education was centralized in some of these hubs as well. Uh, like, you know, when Stanford, a lot of the early Google hires were basically from Stanford. I mean, back in the day, it, you could have justified it in some ways because back in 1990s, uh, there weren't really so many online educational resources available for someone from middle of nowhere or from a developing country to like really gain those skills and become a highly proficient software engineer, for example. But today that's very, very different. And on the one hand, it's becoming incredibly saturated where so many companies are competing for a small sliver of talent available in this technology hubs. And then on the other hand, there is mm -hmm. more and more highly qualified people who are gaining skills and are looking for great opportunities but they don't have access to it mainly because companies haven't really made uh, the mental and operational switch to, hey, we could hire remote employees and have access to great talent, save in many cases on cost of hiring, as well as just overall cost of recruiting because you know what? Like conversion rates when it comes to your offer acceptance rates are incredibly low in places like the Bay Area, but when you're hiring for remote employees, you're one of the three, four options that's actually available. So competition is significantly lower. Right. And then, you know, you have to also think about the retention, right? People, the competitive market, competitive job market, it's difficult to hire someone, but even mm -hmm. harder, some can argue, to keep them because they're going to be pinged by so many other opportunities while you're right. in that location. Right. So that's all the cost right. of hiring. Like if your employees going to only stay for one year, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, all the money you put in front to hire that person can go up. Yeah. And you also mentioned something I interesting, the operational switch. So I think... Mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting because um, the technologies are now 
there. There is the collaboration tools, video conferencing tools, um, also project management tools that's all in the cloud and shareable. So um, why, why do you think some companies up to now, <laughs> now that they're experiencing it in a much larger scale, they might actually have a, the, this is a tipping point, but why do you think a kind of a, uh, companies got stuck in the idea of we have to have an office we have to hire in the office. So like, you know, instead of just going remote, people have been just opening up new offices around the world, right? Why do you think that yeah. kind of a mindset? Mm -hmm. I think it's easy to underestimate the power of inertia, right? I think inertia, like co-located work is how work has been forever, uh, right? So like if, if something, if a way of doing things has been around for essentially as long as you can remember or as long as work has been around, it's very, very difficult mm -hmm. to change it, even if it makes sense on all levels, right? Uh, we, we just, like, it's an unknown to many. And as humans, we're scared of things that we don't know or we don't understand well. And that's why the, the one of the, you know, bright sides, even though there is a lot of dark sides to the current situation, but one of the bright sides is that a lot of companies are starting to, uh, un unfortunately, in a forced way experience that unknown and realizing that mm -hmm. it's it's not that bad right like we can actually conduct remote meetings we can actually have remote uh team sessions we can actually uh you know still build a great culture while running a remote company which mm -hmm. the, the stakes are high when you are like you have the option to do it or to try it like it's very risky to try it what if it goes wrong but now that it's there right. is a forcing function to make it happen, I think it's uh, it's going to generate a lot more momentum than it has been able to generate over the past few years. Yeah. Okay. So let's kind of go into so you know with this current situation, more and more companies will be either hiring remotely mm -hmm. or expand their current remote hiring efforts. So how should we think about the? compensation like you know because there are different living costs you know depending on where mm -hmm. you where you are you know arguably bay area has one of the highest living cost of a living um and your compensation yeah. in a way is kind of a relative to cost of living or as well as also the competition factor right sure so Absolutely. how should the company and... think about just overall yeah like what should be the philosophy yeah. And uh, the interesting thing is that there are several pretty well-known companies that have been doing this for a while. And this is not something where we really need to reinvent the wheel. Companies like GitLab, uh, Envision, Buffer have all been doing a completely distributed team approach for a pretty long time. And even though there is variations on this and when in terms of compensation so for example github is also known to be hiring a lot of a lot remote and their approach historically has been doesn't matter where you are we basically pay the exact same salaries so if you're in the bay area versus you are in uh, texas you kind of essentially get the comp same compensation uh if you're the same argue, role. yeah you get the same compensation yeah. if you're in the same so role the Right. The argument goes that to the company, you deliver the same value to the company. So the cost of the company should be the same. Uh, but I think the more uh, common approach, the approach that's been uh, a lot more scalable so far is that there are multiple factors that are taken into account, uh, such as like location factor, such as your seniority factor, and just multiplying that to your what you would be making to San Francisco to calculate your actual salary. And the rationale there, which at least resonates better uh, in my mind, is that uh, rent is a huge, huge chunk of what you're going to be going to be taken away from your salary and the cost of living overall, right? Cost of goods and everything else. And what your take-home pay is should be fair across uh, the company. And the take-home pay, uh, essentially by paying everybody the same, you're like encouraging people to move out of certain regions, which is a very political action and you may or may not want to be doing, right? Because if you pay everybody the same rate, you're essentially saying if you moved out of Bay Area, if you moved out of certain cities where cost of living is really high, you would be making more money. 
And I don't think you want to be taking that stance versus if you take into account some of these other factors, such as a location factor in terms of what the compensation becomes, then everybody knows that like you're going to be making a fair salary irrespective of where you are. And it's going to be fair across everybody in the same role in the same seniority level. I see. Yeah. So kind of equalizing um, on what is going to be their spending power after taking all the main expenses like rent and just living cost um, away so that people, it's also, you're making the pay for same role, same level similar, but at the kind of a spending power level, take home spending power rather than just the nominal amount that you're giving up. Yeah. And then I can see right. how, yeah, that could really just create more incent- economic incentives for people to think about moving, which is not what you want to necessarily encourage. People should, you know, choose where they want to live based on other factors rather than that's, that's going to be giving me the most money. <laughs> right. So, right. And I, and I guess like the, if you want to keep the bigger picture in mind, the bigger picture here is the main opportunity around making remote work, the future of work is that it just gives economic opportunity, just life opportunities to more and more people. And it helps the world really go beyond resumes, right? Like we don't talk enough about the huge effect that co-located work has on impairing companies' abilities to go beyond resumes because that's it's it's uh they always say that like you know uh, IQ is uniformly distributed but opportunity is not and part of the reason opportunity is not uniformly distributed is that companies aren't able to hire from everywhere uh, it's all it's very closely tied to location so I think that's the bigger goal and one reason behind structuring compensation in this way is that it creates an extra incentive for companies. Because, of course, for every company, cost of uh, employees, cost of the team is going to be a huge, huge component. And this structure encourages companies to adapt remote work more uh, actively because it has a huge economic incentive for them to do so. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because if you have... um, The companies are almost incentivized to provide opportunities where... Uh, there aren't that many opportunities where, you know, like probably outside of the U.S., probably the areas that's not known as the technology hub yet. So kind of talking about along that line, what do you think about also um, the market dynamic into the compensation portion? So some, some companies argue that it should be kind of a strictly about the living cost and adjust, so have a have a benchmark uh, and then adjust it based on the living cost compared to the benchmark. Some companies argue that it should also take into account what are other opportunities are out there. It's almost like in the real estate market, you know, you have a lo- sure. difference based on location, but if somebody just bid mm-hmm. higher, then you just go with, <laughs> okay, we have to match the bid, yeah. right? And that can happen uh, more frequently the- if you're in a tech hub. It's a it's a good argument, but I think uh, in tech hubs where there's a lot of comp- competition, uh, that's usually also what leads to higher cost of living. Uh, it's hard to find. I mean, unless you're living in a like a luxury island or something like that, where the cost of living is high, just because it's just such a uh, beautiful place to live or something. Uh, in most cases, the cost of living is driven in many ways by the existence or abundance of opportunities. And I think that element in many cases already is already factored into uh, the the cost of living. So you don't need to double count it. I'm curious what you think about it, but at least that would be my initial reaction to whether to count it into the formula or not. Yeah, I think from the perspective of creating a philosophy um, of a, I mean, I think it, I think there can be er- areas where um, there's an exception. So I think, yes, I agree that a lot of the rents, for example, if the people who are living in that area have a higher willingness to pay, 
and that's driven by how much they're getting paid already. I think there is a uh, baked into it more or less, but I think there can be some discrepancies based on unique locations. For example, um, if a certain certain city in the world is becoming more and more popular as the the place of um, to hire remote workers just because they have either really good education system um, and then the talent pool that's not yet tapped into. I think there can be a competition that's not yet baked into the living cost because it usually takes some time for the living cost sure. to catch up to the competition. So I think companies yep. can, I think, take notes of, a, you know, well, what what are the areas that we should think about the competition more than others because it's not yet baked into um, the overall market price? Um, I think that's a something to think about. I don't I don't think it's going to yeah. be the norm. You don't have to like have a chart of every single city and their competition. But I think when there right. is a a particular city, uh, you should also think about yeah, what, has it been already counted into the living cost? And if not, then you know, companies should have also ability to make a, yeah. a, a an offer that's attractive, right? Because at the end, yeah. you, you do want to make your offer attractive enough um, so that the person takes it. Yeah, that's a very good point. And I think that really speaks to empowering the recruitment team, because if you only go off of the living cost and some of the other factors, as you said, if the competition has already, especially as remote work starts becoming more and more popular, you will see a surge of competition at certain locations. And as you said, the living cost would take a while to adjust. Uh, so if you don't take that into consideration, you would be just giving very unreasonable compensation packages to your recruitment team. They'll be like, can't close an offer this way because there is another company who's more prepared for this and they're really taking away every great candidate we find. So it's absolutely a great point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what are what are some of the other things? So how how companies should decide on whether we're going to go with the um, equalizing at the nominal level or adjusted level? What are some of the things uh, they should think about? Is that more mostly what philosophy? Mean, what do you mean by the nominal level versus it? Oh, so like the, everybody gets the same versus there's like an adjusted approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's more of a, I, I think that when it comes to building a great team, like fairness is what matters. I think in many ways, it's similar to uh, parenting for parents out there that like your kids don't mind doing anything as long as it's fair. Hmm. We have a, like an ingrained belief that like we want things to be fair. Uh, so I think that's like the number one priority when you're building a team, you want them to have the, the perception and the reality, right? Like and the, hopefully the perception is built based on the reality that it's fair. So I think that should be the guiding philosophy, like no matter what you do, right? As long as it's fair, I think people uh, would perceive it as the right thing to do. And if it seems unfair, uh, they would rebel against it. It doesn't matter if it's like, if everybody makes a really high salary, and uh, some still make slightly more than others, and they feel like it's unfair that they do so, mm -hmm. it would be a rebellion. Uh, and vice versa, if everybody's making a really low salary, but it's fair across the board, uh, and there is a good reason for making a low salary, maybe the company is low on cash or something like that, uh, everybody will still be okay with it. So I think the guiding principle should be fairness, and uh, whichever way you structure it, you got to start from, establishing that and then build based on that. Right. And I think you also touch up on good point. Like not everybody should be paying the average average and or the market rate is just the average of all the possible combinations. And it also depends on the company's situation. Maybe it's more about giving equity than salary. If your company has that philosophy, then you're going to be, you know, the compensation structure will be looking different in terms of uh, what is the, the salary and how it compares to the market rate versus not. And yeah. And how about, um, so, you know, fairness and sounds like you also are touching up on the transparency and communication to the employees that 
kind of a, you know, what is fair as a group and decide that this is what we're going to do and everybody coming on board. How about the tricky one is when company starts from non-remote and transition into the remote, how should, what are some of the things, you know, that they should consider um, making that transition smoother? Right, because if somebody, if you're starting from scratch and everybody is all remote, we have this compensation structure. It's a lot easier to roll out, and you know, because you're going to be hiring people who believe in that philosophy. But if you had an right. existing system and you're moving into the remote one and also different compensation, what are some of the things that they should think about? Yeah. I think the hardest thing about making that transition is that like uh, what happens if whatever formula you came up with for the compensation doesn't really match up with whatever you've been doing so far. I think that's really tough. And the second piece is that like, what if people decide to move out, right? Let's say I'm, let's say you've adapted the adjusted salary approach uh, based on location and cost of living. And I decide to move to a different location. How does that, like, are you going to lower my salary? Because again, that's uh, coming back to fairness. A lot of people would feel like uh, getting paid less is unfair, even though I'm moving. Uh, so there's two two ways to take that, right? Either have a candid conversation, make it clear that if you move to a location where the cost of living is uh, lower, then you're going to be just going to have to adjust to it. That's one of the things that comes with it. Or the other one is to have a shared understanding that that's going to be considered an early promotion. So it's just going to have like a delayed effect on it so that the, the landing is not too rough, right? So essentially by moving to a different location, you're essentially the, the compensation that you're going to be taking uh, on a regular basis is going to be higher in effect. Uh, but we're not going to, we're going to keep it as is with the understanding that this is, like an early promotion for you. So when the next promotion cycle comes, if you in the high cost of living location, you would have been considered for that pay raise. Uh, maybe we will delay that in the next round, just so it's a little bit more spread out and doesn't feel like uh, you're getting somehow punished for the move, even though the exact amount you take home is still going to be the same, even if the salary gets adjusted. Uh, people have the amount of money they get paid on a monthly basis as a number they keep in mind. They don't necessarily do the math every time. So what's my take-home pay? What's going to be the take-home pay when I move? <laughs> so mm -hmm. it can There's be a hard to shot. get over it. Like, yeah, there could be like a psychological effect there. So potentially considering that delayed approach uh, could be better. Mm. But, um, but then people can gain the system, right? Like I just got promoted mm -hmm. and then I just moved to a place that's lower Then you have mm -hmm. kind of a free ride in a way. How would you? Yeah, absolutely. People can game the system, but I think uh, companies are built mm -hmm. on the belief that like your team acts from the interest of the company and that isn't necessarily mm -hmm. trying to game the system. So I think if your team is going to be trying to game the company to make more money, I think you have deeper problems there. And compensation as a whole. Uh, so yeah. uh, while you're absolutely right that it could be gamed, I think uh, if it is being gamed, you have much, much bigger problems to worry about. Then the compensation adjustment at the moment, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, uh, you know, the insightful advice on how how to think about remote hiring and also compensation. It is a topic that I think a lot of the um, talent leaders think about as they are, you know, moving into the more, more and more remote based workforce. So hopefully mm -hmm. this was very helpful for our listeners. All right. Absolutely. Well, thank, thank you so much for everyone. the insightful questions. Yeah. Thanks to everyone for watching as well. Um, for more tips and advice on data driven recruiting, please visit ddr.codesignal.com.